few minutes after, I think most of the group will probably straggle in in the next few minutes, but it's probably a good idea to go ahead and get started since everyone's short on time. So welcome everyone to the West Coast Fellows Conference now in year two. Um, really excited to, to have everybody here. Obviously very excited to have Dr. David Skaggs with us, who's gonna talk about developing a high functioning surgical team. Um, David is somebody who uh, I have a lot in common with in terms of where he went to medical school and, and uh, in residency and had a, the opportunity to, to meet him at the Bridging the Gap conference uh, recently. And um, doesn't need much of an introduction, but is now at uh, Cedars, um, Director of Pediatric Orthopedics, Co-Director of the Spine Center, and somebody who's been a leader in our field and who we're really excited to, to have talk to us. So a, a brief plug for the Bridging the Gap meeting where I, I met Skaggs in person finally. Um, there will be some funding opportunities for fellows to travel to the meeting, West Coast Fellows, which will be in San Diego towards the end of the year. So, so looking forward to that uh, as well. And if any questions or, or comments or want to know more about the meeting, uh, anyone can just message Greg or I and, and we'll uh, tap you in. So Skaggs, with that, I'll turn over uh, the screen share. And thanks in advance, man. Really appreciate it. Annie, hey, nice to see and chat with you. So I'm going to share my screen here, see if I could do this effectively. Yeah. One second. Here we go. So could everyone see this? Yeah, we got it, Skaggs. Awesome. Okay, so fellows, <laughs> whoever else is on, we're gonna talk about developing and leading a high functioning surgical team. And I'm gonna to propose to you that you have spent so much time learning how to put a pedicle screw safely into places in the human body that could never have been done 20 or 30 years ago. You are probably technically skilled beyond belief compared to what people came out 20, 30, 40 years ago. But if you really want to help your patients, I bet you the next place you can put your time to really help is the soft skills of team building, team leading, and maximizing everybody's output in the room and having you produce something greater than the individual sum of its parts. So let's see if I can get this to actually go to the next. Okay, so disclosures. I'm a piecemeal laborer. I'm almost useless without my team. And honestly, I'm still working to do better on all the things in this talk. Yeah, this is a tough talk to give because one could be perceived as being holier than thou and like, what a great leader am I? Um, but it's not true at all. I kind of give this talk to remind myself of these basic truths that I could really, I do struggle every day to be better on. So first off, accept yourself as a team leader, accept the mantle of leadership. At this talk, we're going to talk about the culture of preparation, how to empower everyone in the room, and the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. You are going to be doing really cool stuff in your career, but don't for a, has, don't for a moment uh, forget that you have people's lives in your hand. One slip, someone never walks again, or they're dead. So this is a high stakes game. Now, you are in a unique position as a new team leader. There's a fine balance between having too much confidence and being a jerk, you know, or having imposter syndrome and thinking, wow, could I really do this? I'm not doing this as well or as fast as my mentors. And it is a fine balance. If you go too much one way or too much the other way, you're going to lose your team and they're not going to respect you. So the real disclosure here is that surgeons in general think that the level of teamwork in the room is much higher than other people in the room. So this study that was done found that surgeons, 75% of them thought that there was a high level of teamwork in the room where only 10% of the anesthesia residents thought there was a high level of, of uh, teamwork in the room. So I think that we have to realize that this is a blind spot. We probably think we're doing better than we are. So I love uh, James Clear in the book, Atomic Habits said, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. So a lot of leading a high functioning team is creating systems so that things don't fail. A lot of leading the team takes place outside of the operating room or before the surgery. So the Boy Scout motto, be prepared. 
create a culture of preparation. So we've all you know, heard about this book. We've all heard about checklists. There's probably too many checklists, but one of the cool things you can do with a checklist is give it to the family of the patient. I tell patients, hey, I have thousands of patients, but your family has one patient. And if they get the same checklist that my nurse, fellow, and resident gets, they're not going to let us miss anything. And they're going to feel part of the team and it decreases their anxiety. Another thing you could do is have a preoperative spine class run by nurses. And the Gallup poll nurses every single year the most trusted physician. Simply prepping people ahead of time in terms of patients and families decreases anxiety and increases compliance. So I moved to Cedars almost two years ago. The first thing I did, we had a trial run for a pediatric spine fusion. I had 24 people in the room. We had neuromonitoring. We had equipment reps. We had everyone. We pretended that we were doing a surgery on a dummy. Now, I was a little hesitant to do this. And I felt, you know, am I being kind of precious or special here? But it was amazing how many other surgeons all over the facility came up and said, that was brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? So if you're going to a new place and maybe doing surgeries that haven't done before, been done before, there are new equipment, consider a trial run that lets everyone on your team feel that they are respected and valued by you. And another aspect of a culture of preparation is every weekend I sit down and look at every imaging study and read the notes on all my patients and then send out an email and now goes out for about 50 team members. And a lot of times I get an email back going, hey, what about this? What about that? And I not only then have about 50 people thinking and planning to help make the surgery go well, it also creates the idea that I value everyone's opinion. They are part of the team and it matters. So it's also giving everyone in the team a little bit of respect. So culture of preparation share the plan of all surgeries with col colleagues at Indications Conference. The Cedar Spine Indications Conference is going on right this moment. All of our faculty have all of their cases presented pre-op and post-op. A study at Columbia University found that 28% of the time when you're planning a big deformity surgery, the plans change if it's presented at a pre-op conference. And basically, it's also good marketing. You could tell families, hey, you're getting multiple free second opinions that you don't even know about. So, you know, you, you may or may not know that one of my hobby horses is using power tools such as special drill bits to cannulate a pedicle and put it in screws to help prevent overuse injuries in surgeons. And I think it's safer in patients. But I realized that for years, I had a PGY1 resident with a drill bit in their hand for the first time putting a pedicle screw in a human being. It's much better to have surgical simulations where now ahead of time with every single trainee, we go over how to use these tools, how to put in a pedicle screw on a model before going to a human being. So a little bit of preparation creates a lot better intraoperative performance. And here's one of the things we just did recently. There's a paper out of Seattle it shows if the surgeons and the x-ray techs use the same language for CR movements, it works much better. And we're hopefully gonna show that there's even less radiation for the patient because there's less uh, incorrect shots that have to be repeated. So what we did is we put the surgeons in a room, we got the x-ray leadership in the room, we agreed upon this language and we're in the process of printing this up and putting it in every OR. So there could be a continuous unrelenting pursuit of excellence. We can always get better. We can always bring people into the team. Now, one of the, this slide drives me nuts because surgeons in general often think that they should not be questioned. And on the other hand, airline pilots think they should always be questioned. And you know, we're probably all sick of hearing about how good the airline industry is at safety compared to surgeons, but it's true. You know, surgeons are afraid of their mistakes coming to light and somewhat they could be sued whereas airline pilots are very quick to say what their mistakes are. So a study at Google looked at the highest performance teams and the number one predictor of high performance was psychological safety. And what that meant is that everybody in the team felt comfortable speaking up. Now, how do you create that culture? 
One is you thank people for bad suggestions. If someone says something stupid and you laugh, nobody's going to make a suggestion again. If you thank them for the suggestion, talk through it, show them respect, then people are going to make suggestions. And trust me, so many times somebody in the room has made a suggestion that made the surgery better than what I would have done on my own. So you have a choice to make. Do you want to be that surgeon who is frustrated saying, do I have to tell you again? Or do you want to be the surgeon saying, great idea, thank you. The more open you are to ideas, the more you'll get ideas. And if you are the smartest person in every room, it means you're in the wrong room. You should be surrounded by really smart people. Like there is no doubt in my mind that the neuromonitoring person in my room knows way more about neuromonitoring than I know. I'm relying on them. Now, there's been studies showing that if surgeons are abusive or over-controlling in the operating room, it hurts team performance, and it can't be made up for later. Um, good, late, good leadership afterwards doesn't help. So there is going to be a situation which all of, us, all of us face in which you've lost your temper or you're short with someone. And I faced it a few weeks ago. A uh, trainee was tightening a screw on a cross connector. And unfortunately, I had my fingers over the spine and the screwdriver slipped. It hit my fingers. It hurt. And I yelled. And afterwards, I said, I shouldn't have yelled. I'm sorry. It came from a place of fear, not from anger. Um, so you're going to be you're going to you know, lose your stuff sometimes. You're not going to always behave well. And the key then is apologize immediately, apologize publicly and it hopefully won't hurt your team too much. Um, I learned from a seasoned medical school dean that when physicians are behaving badly, it's mostly because they believe they're acting to protect their patients. However, that doesn't make it an excuse. And if you behave badly towards your team member, you're gonna lose them, the team's not gonna function. So apologize early, apologize often. So how do you get everybody to speak up and wanna help you? If someone's brand new in my OR, I often say, I need all the help I can get. I'm someone's husband. Show some humility, ask for help. People want to help you. So how do you empower everyone in the OR to speak up? One way is if you're trying to figure out, hey, what level are we at? If I say, I think we're at L3, you know, who's gonna disagree? If you ask the most junior person in the room, maybe ask the medical student, hey, what level do you think we're at? then everyone in the room is also going to think, what level am I at? And you're going to have consensus rather than just having people agree with you. So here's another thing. When you do pediatric spine deformity surgery, we want the blood pressure low at first so you don't lose bleeding. But once we correct the spine, we need the maps about 75 and above. And I can't tell you how many times I'd ask anesthesia, hey, are the maps up? They go, yes. I'd look over the screen and the maps wouldn't be up. They'd say, well, we're trying. So all we did was just bring light to it. We put a monitor. Right now we have three monitors in the room. So everybody in the room could see the maps. And when we cut the rods and we're about to put the rods in, the equipment rep, the circulator, everybody's looking up to see are the maps high enough. So it creates a different culture where we are all working together to make sure we're doing the right thing. So when we have a, you know, lectures in person like the old days, I'd ask, so who in the room thinks they're good at names? At the most, you know, with 100 people, maybe one or two people would raise their hands. Now, I'm going to propose to you that you're bad at names because you just don't care that much. Okay, so that's a strong statement. How can I make that statement? I'm going to bet that if you had to learn the names of a thousand useless chemicals, you could do it and you can get a good grade in organic chemistry. So if you really care about learning everyone's names, you can do it. You know, one trick that I've learned is when I meet new people, I put it in Apple Notes. If I have a new circulator, a new scrub tech, it goes in Apple Notes and I remember it. Another way to do this is as part of the timeout, have everyone state their name. Uh, I've heard rumors of this study, but I've never seen it, that if the attending surgeon knows everybody's name in the OR, there's less complications. It just makes sense. So crisis management. In spine surgery, there will be times when there's crises. There will be times when the blood pressure is falling or when neuromonitoring changes have taken place. So how do we deal with that? Number one, what we do is create 
a pathway of how we deal with it ahead of time, review it with people, get buy-in in time. And I think, for instance, if you're doing spinal deformity, every OR in the world should have the neuromonitoring checklist up on the wall so that we have a way to deal with this that we thought about ahead of time. Again, it comes back to preparation. And during crisis management, you know, when people look at firefighters, military, other type crisis situation, one of the keys is repeating back critical communication. I can't tell you how many uh, medical legal cases I've been asked to review where the neuromonitoring text says, I told the surgeon we lost signals. And the surgeon said, they never told me. So when I ask, how are signals? And they say, we lost it in the left leg. I repeat it back. You lost signals in the left leg? Yes. It's not nerdy. Repeat back. You know, somebody's long-term health is depending on you communicating correctly. So if there is a crisis, it's good judgment, not weakness, to phone a friend. Make this your culture. So our culture is if there's any extended loss of signals, which I'd say is five minutes or more, I want another attending surgeon either in the room or on the phone just to run things by and make sure that I'm not missing anything. Because especially as a young surgeon, when you lose signals, your adrenaline's going to be flowing. You might not be thinking clearly. When it happens to you 200 times, like it has to me and your hair is gray, nah, I don't get an adrenaline shot anymore. But I still love to bring in another attending surgeon and get a second opinion. No reason not to. So uh, Greg Bundes, I think, brought in, or maybe it was Bert, brought in one of his friends who ran a Blue Angels uh, group. And what I learned from the Blue Angels group is after every single one of their shows, they have a debriefing. And what happens is the leader starts saying, what could I have done better? So I've now adopted this to my OR. So as soon as I unscrub, I say, okay, everyone, what could we have done better? And I start with myself. I could have planned this better. I could have you know, identified this quicker. And after I say that, other people chime in. You know, oftentimes the scrub tech chimes in, anesthesia chimes in, and everyone says what we can have done better. And it really brings us together, showing that we're all humble, we're on the same team, we're aligned, we're going in the same direction. It feels right. It doesn't feel like there's any blaming of each other. And every time we do it, it somehow deepens our trust in each other. So it's really important to run towards your complications not away from your complications. Complications is where we learn the most. And when you ask a partner to review a complication, they are flattered. That's an opportunity to deepen your peer relationship and trust with them. And it's, don't just share complications, of course, share your success. The people in the OR only see the patient for that short amount of time. If we can share how they're doing afterwards and how the grateful the family is, they get to share in that success also. Uh, where I've seen many leaders in academic medicine fail is tolerating negative behavior, praise publicly, criticize privately, and write down when people do things wrong, because if you have to get rid of people, you need a trail in writing. When you send an email to someone, they know that they better change or that things are gonna end at some point. And if you want to get things done, again, most of the time you're getting things done outside of the OR. The personal meeting takes more time and more work, but it's much more effective than the email or the text. The email or the text is easy to feel anger and to create silos. The personal meeting is much more likely to create people working together. One of the greatest leaders I've ever worked with, Bruce Gewertz at Cedars, Chief of Surgery, taught me to tell people, my relationship with you is more important than this issue. You say that, people stop fighting you, they're on your team, and they all of a sudden come around to your side of seeing things. So we've come into the 20 minute part. So I'm going to zoom through these last ones. And I'm going to say when I started off as a new attending, I was too hard on people. I was too short with the scrub techs. And I felt bad about it. After really working at this for years, I came into the OR one day. It was honestly maybe the happiest day of my professional life in the OR that people put team skags in their back. And I felt like, okay, finally I got over this. I'm being a good guy in the OR. Uh, and 
it was pretty wonderful. But I only got there after not doing a good job at first and after trying really hard. So that's the end of the talk. And I would love to entertain any questions. I was told to leave 10 minutes at the end. Really appreciate it, David. That was awesome. And actually, if it's okay, I'll, I'll lead off the questions. It's kind of a, a dovetail from the last slide that you presented. Um, I'm about four and a half, almost five years out now. And I think a lot of us have that same issue. You know, you're so invested in the outcome of every patient because you don't have that long of a track record that you can be hard on your staff. And I think oftentimes you realize it and you'll try to apologize after the fact, but that's probably not the most effective way to resolve the issue. So are there any things that you learned or things that you did to get over that hump and to kind of be more like yourself in the OR or was it just a matter of time and you had to get to a certain number of cases and, and you just kind of naturally transitioned? Yeah, I, I think that that's wise, Hanny. Part of it is time. You know, if somebody walks into the OR, you know, the first day out of fellowship and thinks that they are going to do as well as they will 10 or 20 years later, you know, they're lying to themselves. Um, that's just not the case. You're probably not going to be quite as slick um, at your first case as you will be at your thousandth. But I think one of the things that is true is when you do, you know, lose your temper just a bit or when you're short just a bit, if you publicly apologize in front of everyone, I think you will have gained so much respect from everyone in the team because surgeons don't usually do that. The good news is the bar is pretty low. You know, surgeons are kind of known sometimes for being jerks. And all you have to do is just be a normal person and apologize. And you're going to look like the nicest person in the world. Awesome. Awesome talk, Dave. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a bit overwhelmed too, uh, because there are so many pearls in there that uh, I hope folks rewatch this. And especially as the guys in this call go in their own practices, uh, I think it's very, very important that you um, that you learn some of these soft skills, uh, like Dave mentioned. And the earlier you learn them, actually, the more joyful I think your life will end up being. Um, and uh, uh, so anyways, thank you, Dave, so much uh, for that. I'll, I'll tell you, as a guy that's been in practice for you know 15 years now, and this is for sure one of the things that we still work on. And I would say that perhaps passively, some of these pearls are things I naturally do in the operating room, but they're not organized. And um, uh, what would you say, Dave, like, I mean, you have so many great things that you put in there, and whether it was like the team huddle or the team email or, um, uh, you know, um, one of the other 20 things that you just mentioned, I got to go through it again. Like, where would you start? Like to say, oh, hey, you know, all right. So if you're going to do one thing in the operating room today, like what would it be to start this whole process of really growing your team in the right way? Yeah. Or if you're a new fellow graduating, like what would be the first steps you take? Well, I tell you what, the first thing I do, honestly, is to figure out the first day in the OR, who's going to be on your team and individually speak with each one of them. Now, it may be just physically walking into the room, walking up to the tech, introducing yourself. I tend to do it by first name and then have a little discussion with everyone in the room. Have a one on one discussion with anesthesia, with neuromonitoring with the tech, with the circulator, and simply by saying hi one-on-one, -on -one, telling them your name, you've established a relationship and they're going to feel that they're respected and they can talk to you. It's very simple. And it's almost kind of embarrassing when you walk into a new room and you're like, oh my God, I'm the boss. Like these people have been here for 20 years and now I'm in charge. Um, so, so it is a tough situation to be in. You don't have a history uh, or track record with these people. So I think the one-on-one, -on -one, looking someone in the eye, letting them hear the humbleness in your voice is a way to establish a relationship. And Greg Mundus, I want to thank you for something. You recommended I read the book Awareness. And in the book Awareness, they say an interpersonal relationship, when a negative feeling arises, now we have a second problem. So if you have one problem, maybe like, hey, the right equipment wasn't there, that's one problem. But if you yell at someone in sterile processing, now you have a second problem. Uh, so I think the yeah. surgeons checking their own behavior is kind of important. Yeah. Hey, Vince, did you want to say something? 
JC, were you going to chime in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, um, David, these are amazing tips. And I, I mean, I, I think we all want to be competent and superlative surgeons. And we, as you said, we focus on the surgical technique. But I think what you are describing here is probably the single most untaught skill that would bring you success. Um, and I think that it's uh, difficult to learn because a lot of times the things that we are, uh, that you're describing feel unnatural to us. Um, you know, calling in people, bringing in a huddle. Uh, you're right that as surgeons, we are not often uh, seeing that behavior model. So I really want to applaud your honesty and bring this forward. I think that, you know, like Greg, I've been in practice 15 years. We have a very, I would argue, high functioning group here in Seattle. And I think one of the things that I found that uh, dovetails with what you're describing is uh, our use of advanced practice providers, you know, PAs and ARNPs and we do not have residents. We have a fellow here, but um, I think we have chosen to essentially appropriately, I would argue, delegate a lot of responsibility and authority to our team members so that it is less about every single thing has to come directly from the surgeon. And my word is the end of the road. And instead saying we are all a team, and we all have ownership over this. And in, in giving you responsibility, I am also giving you charge. I, I, told one of our lead PAs about two years ago, I want you to take work home with you. And she said, I, I don't want to do that. And I said, no, no, I don't actually need you to go home and do work, but I want <laughs> you to go home and be thinking about work. When you're, you know, when you're taking a shower, you're lying in bed in the morning. I want you to think about, man, when I did that yesterday, I could have done that better. I was like, because the risk that I think we run into with a lot of our team members is that I mean, in the end, they are shift workers, right? They show up at a certain time and they leave at a certain time. And I think as surgeons, we often feel the mantle of responsibility. Um, I think that being able to give over some of that responsibility and create a team where everyone has some ownership is critical to assuring all of our successes. Yep. Yeah. If I had surgery, I would want it to be with a team where many people re feel responsibility. And oftentimes I find that if you know, I tell the PA, your whole job is closing. Make sure this incision is beautiful. Boy, does she take pride in that. <laughs> My incisions look so much better when the PA closes it. Yeah. I agree. Dr. Chapman, you had your hand up earlier. It looks like maybe he's been pulled away. Hey, Hanny, you know what? I want to thank you for doing this. Unfortunately, we have an indications conference at this exact time. But this meeting is so good, we pull our fellows out of the meeting and have them get on your meeting instead of ours. So thank you for doing this. That means a lot. That means a lot to, I think, all of us here. And uh, I appreciate everybody signing on. Like, Wait, there's Jens. Jens, I see him. You, have you want to say something? Dr. Chapman, do you hear us? I think, he's, I think he may be dual meeting right now, which is a new phenomenon because it looks like it's going back and forth. But regardless, thanks so much, David. It was awesome. Uh, I think we're all on the same page regarding the import of this topic and uh, look forward to seeing you all next month and uh, everybody have an awesome weekend and a great day.